In my experience, living in a city has had its fair share of upsides, even financially. One of the last things we typically associate with city living is affordability. Really, it's the opposite. We associate unaffordability. Cities can be expensive from the rent to the groceries to the price of anything. Toilet paper, tote bags, kombucha, you name it. So one of the first considerations, if not the first consideration you may have when thinking of moving to a city is the cost of living. And it's a fair consideration. But are there opportunities to save money that are not available to people in the suburbs? Are there opportunities that are unique to cities? I would argue yes. Now let's be fair. In a city, it's easy to get caught up in the expensive lifestyle. Luxury condos, high-end stores, and getting sweet green every day for lunch at work. I'm guilty of one of those. But if there's one expense that I'm not guilty of paying for, it's car maintenance, and car insurance, and gas. You probably guessed right, I don't have a car. And so it's this idea of going carless that is uniquely possible, uniquely doable, only in a walkable area, in a city. Because what you may pay extra in rent, in groceries, in sweet green, you may save from just not having a car. Let's first acknowledge that some people just need a car. If you commute out of the city for work, if you go to a business park, for example, there's really no way around it, you need a car. But let's assume you don't for a second. Let's assume you live in a city, you work in a city, that it's all self-contained. In that case, which is also my case, having a car can at best be minorly convenient, but at worst can be a big nuisance. Minorly convenient can be the ability to go on a day trip outside of the city, but a nuisance can be having to find street parking, not being able to take your car downtown, lack of parking and also traffic. The list goes on and on and on. They say in Boston that it takes an hour to get from Boston to Boston, and I can attest to that, in a car at least. I can count on my fingers the amount of times that I've really needed a car to accomplish something in my area. And when I do, there are some solutions that are a lot more economical than having your own car. Take a service like Zipcar, for example. If you're in a city, then, well, they're everywhere. Easily accessible. And as someone who only needs a car in the most sparing of situations, I would have to book a lot of Zipcars to justify getting a car instead. Let's do the math. There's a couple of ways we can incur costs with zip cars. First is the standard membership, $9 a month or 108 a year, or you can pay up front and it's 90 for the year, but we're just gonna assume $9 a month. Next is the cost of actually renting a zip car. In my area, the prices are hovering typically around 15 an hour. You tack on taxes, fees, young driver's fees, and the optional insurances. Typically now it averages around 18 to 19 per hour. Now we can estimate car expenses. The average insurance per month in Massachusetts, where I live, is roughly 200 a month. And the average American per month typically spends between 150 and 200 on gas. We'll call it 175. And according to AAA, the average amount people spend on car maintenance is around $100 a month. Again, these are all rough estimates. Car payment, so now I ran the estimates for if you have a payment or if you don't. Average Massachusetts car payment is 430. I actually averaged the averages for the new and the used car payments, and that's all I got 430. So with the car payment, your monthly spend is 905. And without a payment, it's 475. But the real question is, how many hour-long zip car rides would you really need to book per month to justify just getting a car instead? Turns out the answer is between 26 and 50 hours per month. 26 and 50 hours. It's a lot of hours. And it doesn't even count carpooling. Most of my zip cars, because we do day trips, are typically split three, four, five different ways because we're all carpooling in the same zip car. So as you can see, it takes a lot to justify having a car, maintaining a car in a city. Let's bring up those numbers again. 905 on the high end, 475 on the low end, car expenses. What would you do with that money if it wasn't going to a car every single month? Here's one example. Let's say you're in a city now and you have this car, but you're not really using it for work. Maybe you use it a couple times a week, an errand here, a day trip there, but it isn't, let's say, moving the needle when it comes to your overall life experience, your happiness, your comfortability. In this case, I think it makes a lot of financial sense to ditch the car. Depending on your city, there may be a lot of alternative transportation options public transit, zip car, or alternative vehicles. But we'll get to that one soon. And I think it's also really important to realize that if you're in a city, there's no need to act above using services like public transit. And I would say if that's really all that's keeping you from ditching the car, that being the perceived status, the status symbol of having that car, I think it's time to consider why you have the car in the first place. And if it actually makes sense to have, or if it's more of like an ego boost. Here's another scenario. Let's say you're in the suburbs now, you're moving to a city and you're potentially ditching your car it's very likely that your cost of living is gonna go up. Ditching your car could very well be the financial push that makes city living a viable option for you. It's gonna stabilize your cost of living. It's really gonna bring it down, balance it back out. 
And on a bigger note, there's a reason why we crave the accessible, walkable, community-based living as opposed to the more separative, like hyper-individualized living that comes with suburban life. We are tribal creatures. We crave community, walkability, all of these things that are in opposition to suburban life. But for now, understand that ditching your car doesn't have to deprive you of any ability to get where you want to go, metaphorically and literally. There are other, more cost-effective, and also in my opinion a lot more fun, ways to get around and to live. So like I've been alluding to, there's a lot of moving parts here, literally. A lot of costs and considerations that go into living this no-car lifestyle. So we can start real quick by comparing my real-life expenses in a city to a hypothetical of what they would be if I was in the suburbs with a car. It was tough to find an exact number for how much cheaper the suburbs are to cities. I plugged in several mass suburbs, compared them to Boston in terms of cost of living, and it averaged to roughly 30% cheaper. On the left side is my current monthly living expenses in Boston. No car, 2500 On the right side is my hypothetical suburbs expense, with almost everything calculated at 30% cheaper. A few expenses though, they just won't change. My healthcare premium, for example, my subscription services, and utilities. Actually, utilities are generally more expensive in the suburbs because more square footage, but I give it the benefit of the doubt, left it the same. Finally, we want to remove public transit and add in those car expenses we calculated before. We're going to assume, since I'm moving to the suburbs, that I just got a car, so we have a car payment. And you can see, the suburbs actually surprisingly come in at nearly 200 more than my city expenses when you factor in transportation. So from just a number standpoint, you can see that city life can actually be fairly feasible when you ditch the car. But this is more the part of the video where we put the numbers aside. I got this scooter like a year ago at this point, and it genuinely has been one of the best purchases I've ever made, if not the best. And honestly, it was on a whim. My roommate and I, we actually got the same exact scooter at the same exact time. And I feel like for both of us, the way we engage with life and with our city has completely changed. I grew up watching guys like Casey Neistat, and I remember that first boosted board video that he made back in the day. And 15 year old me was so excited to one day do the same thing, get on that same board. This scooter for me, it feels like the evolution of what 15 year old me wanted, that desire that he had to zip around and adventure around the streets of New York. I mean, this thing is tricked out, no question. If you're wondering, it's a Mantis 8, 53 pounds, which I've come to realize is actually pretty light when you move up and up in scooter power. And they say it goes 25 miles an hour. I've hit 27 once going down this one hill in Back Bay. And seriously, this beats driving a car any day of the week. The way I've been able to maneuver around this city feels so fluid. I'm weaving through cars, through side streets. Scooters let you do this cool thing where you can pass every car at a red light and you can position yourself right at the front of the line. A nice bonus is if your city has these little bike boxes. And I know this thing is way faster than the MBTA. My idea for this video was to present an option or an idea for a slightly alternative lifestyle. Because I felt like the car in American society is sort of put on this pedestal and regarded as like a goal that you should aspire to. But at the same time, a lot of what I feel like I dislike about American society, American infrastructure, can kind of be boiled down and exemplified in the car or just car-centric living. I mean, no one wants to live here. And I think American cities also have a long way to go. But there's a different energy when the place you live in is even remotely walkable. It's like the little things. You see flyers popping up for community events, seeing people on the streets just hanging out at all times of the day. It feels like you're part of something and that there's always something going on. And the scooter for me is the way I'm able to navigate that. This is Ian the Sage. I hope you enjoyed. I'll catch y'all later.